Hey, everybody, this is G. Marks, and welcome to another episode of Biz Books, where I speak to some really smart business book authors about their books uh, so we can all learn a little bit about it. And maybe I can entice you to buy a copy or two. Thank you very much for joining me. Today's book is called Beating Inflation, an Agile, Concrete, and Effective Corporate Guide. I mean, it's not relevant or anything, of course, right? Uh, and I've got both of the authors here with me, Herman Simon and Adam Ector. So both of you guys, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Pleasure. We look forward to our discussion. I'm glad. And so, so do I. And by the way, I should have told you before we start we started recording this when we're done our conversation. Um, don't leave. Well, I'll say my goodbyes to to our audience and all that. But hang on, I'll stop the recording, and that way we can we can personally say goodbye to each other. Okay. Um, so, Herman, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and the company, as well as you know why you decided to work with Adam and and write this book. In my first life, I was a professor, a university professor for 16 years. And uh, my research area was pricing. But I had the ambition to have more impact on practice than a typical professor can have. That's why I founded Simon Kutcher. Dr. Kutcher was my first doctoral student. And we started the company in 1985 with a focus on pricing. Today, we have 2,100 employees and 45 offices all over the world and as a global leader in price consulting. And that's a topic which is, of, very, uh, of course, very close to inflation. Yeah. So we are here to deal with inflation and to give advice on how to beat inflation. Excellent. Adam, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm an active partner with SKP, which means I'm working with clients day in and day out. Uh, background in mechanical engineering, always had an interest in finance and did that as a master's, but been with the company now for over a decade, uh, working with our clients and then kind of watching as inflation came through. I think Herman and I have gone on to say, you know, it's a monetary phenomenon that manifests itself in prices that we pay. Mm -hmm. Who better to think about it uh, than the world's leading pricing consultancy? Just if I can uh, dig in a little bit more, and, and Herman, I'll switch back to you about the company. And so you're, you're a pricing consultancy. Are your clients mainly you know, larger corporate brands? Are they worldwide? Um, and what can, this is a three-part question. And when you talk about pricing and consulting, you know, specifically, what do your clients hire you to do? Every product and every service has a price. Mm -hmm. And uh, the management has to decide on this price, which is a decision under high uncertainty. Because the core of pricing is not price as such, it's the value to customer, or more precisely, the perceived value to customer. So you really have to understand value. We have clients all over the world, from China to the US to Europe, and in all industries. But we are specialized according to industries because the habits of pricing and the information you need differs from industry to industry. We have uh, very large multinationals and also a lot of mid-sized companies, especially what I call hidden champions, uh, global market leaders, which are not known because they are not as big as Apple or uh, the other big guys. Got it. With apologies, we're going to we're going to focus, you know, mainly this conversation on on U.S. you know the U.S. economy and U.S. companies. That's yeah. generally who my audience is. Um, and and as both of you know, you know, we are going through an inflationary period now. Uh, it is honestly, I was a kid in high school when we had our last bout of significant inflation, in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, you know, this is not not that. Um, but it's still enough that's causing a lot of pain and a lot of challenges for a lot of businesses. Uh, when your know, prices are raising, you know, we're at between a seven and eight percent overall increase uh, so far. Before I step into the book, I'm curious for both of your perspectives. And Adam, I'll, I'll start with you because again, you guys deal with a lot of different companies and in different industries. When the government reports the uh, you know inflation in general, uh, and generally, I like to look at the producer price index because to me, it seems like a leading indicator of, you know, what inflation is going to be when it finally gets sold. Um, I, you know, right now the government reports it at around seven point four percent. This is the U.S. government. Um, I have a lot of other clients that that are seeing price increases much higher than that right now. 
And when you dig into some of the core items in the producer price index, like building materials, you know, gypsum, uh, uh, industrial chemicals, uh, concrete, fertilizer, animal feed, those things at freight, those things are still like in double digit range, you know? So I first, as we set the sort of foundation for a conversation about pricing, uh, and I'll start with you, Adam, and, I, and Herman, I'd love to get your perspective on this as well. This inflationary environment that we're in right now, it's hitting some industries harder than others, correct, Adam? It's not just the 7% increase. Some industries, and I'm sure some of your clients are seeing price increases over the past year of a lot more than that. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's spot on, Gene. And I think you know, we often tell folks, be careful with the uh, the risk of averages, right? Those yeah. PPIs and CPIs, they're all average numbers that aggregate a lot of complexity. So it is definitely fair to think that different industries are going to move through a similar experience, but at different paces. And that was one of the things that you know, sparked the ability to write a book like this was way back in 2020, when a lot of the headlines were saying transitory, et cetera, we were working with, you know, Plastic companies when Texas froze in 2001, lumber companies when that went crazy last summer, and you could start to see massive fluctuations, massive differences of behavior, and it would kind of see us trending toward an, a CPI number in the high single digits, but we knew some of our clients were needing to push through 12, 20, 40% price increases in some cases, and then they were having to do it monthly. So it absolutely affects different businesses in different ways, both on the way up and on the way back down. Yeah, uh, I think that's what you know. The big question people are asking us now is, is it a perpetual up? Is it a slowing up? When are these things going to start coming down? And in the book, we we explore how different markets experience it differently from a timing perspective. But as you get into monetary inflation, that's something that no one can really avoid. Right, and and Herman, just to sort of piggyback on on Adam's comments, and again setting the stage for our discussion about pricing during an inflationary period. Uh, we are, you know, we, we inflation this time around was really there's back in the 70s and 80s. A lot of it was money. It's just it was mostly money supply related and energy. And here we've got energy. We've got supply chain. We've got money supply and it's international. I mean, it's not just in the U.S. You know, most companies are dealing countries are dealing with this. So do, do you also agree that inflation itself is um, it, it depends on the industry? And I'm kind of curious, can you know, what what industries, what clients of yours, Herman, have you seen? you know, really, you know, really bear the brunt of these price increases over the past year? It differs very, very strongly from industry to industry. Right. Both on the cost side and on the demand side. Right. Of course, you mentioned all the, 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 the cost uh, drivers and, and sectors like energy, uh, electronic ships, uh, lumber, building materials. Uh, that is one side, uh, and, and it, it's important to distinguish two categories of inflation drivers. One are the bottlenecks, the supply chain uh, problems, scarcities like in electronic ships, and the other is the uh, expansion of the, of the money supply. The first cause will gradually disappear. Actually, today I read that uh, the bottleneck in ships, uh, electronic ships, is, is less serious. Yes. But the other side is equally, or let me give you one example, which uh, surprises most people. Why has the price for tomatoes, tomatoes go, gone up so much? Mm. Tomatoes in uh, most uh, countries are energy because they are grown in, in greenhouses and you need energy. So the energy price makes up a very large part of the cost of a tomato. Uh, but nobody thinks of that. They just think it's, 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 it's a tomato. Mm. The other side, the demand side is equally important. And just to, to illustrate one difference, in one of our studies, um, we found that in the, at the supermarket, 54% of the consumers say they pay more attention to price. They switch to cheaper product, to no-name products. They go to discounters like Aldi, etc. And for vacation, only 18% said that. Hmm. So after three years of, of Corona, people want to get a, for a vacation. And so somebody who is in the holiday, in the hospitality vacation business, has a totally different willingness to pay or change in willingness to pay compared 
to Walmart uh, or a, a supermarket company. And you have to understand this to get your price right. You, you cannot just pass through your costs without considering how the willingness to pay has changed. That is the most difficult factor. And that is the area where we can really help because we understand value and derive from that willingness to pay and the changes. You know, Herman, you, you bring up such a great point about, you know, about you know, the, the different types of businesses and like the, the price of tomatoes. If you're in, if you're a retailer, or you're a grocery store and your price of tomatoes goes up, you're going to most, most likely raise the prices that you're selling it to all of your customers that come in, you know, come into your store. But I, I'm wondering if you can speak to, you know, what I'm also experiencing um, is that I, and you, you, you write about this in your book, you know, when I, when I go to my clients today, um, I mentioned earlier how this is not the inflation that we saw back in the 70s and 80s, but it, you know, it's still inflation. Um, and one of the things that a lot of the smaller and mid-sized businesses didn't have, only the largest companies didn't have back then, but but have now is that there's a lot more data, you know. And I'm seeing a lot of my own clients um um, more target their price increases, whether it's a one-time, whether it's a step increase, but they're, they're targeting it. They're breaking it down by product line. They're breaking it down by customers as well. I have some cases where I have clients that are increasing prices for one customer on a, on, and for the same product, having a much less of an increase for another customer because they, they're still getting enough margin and they want to protect that relationship. So I guess my question is, Herman, you know, and again, you know, using your book as a basis, how important is it to break down your data and and rather than giving an across the board price increase, um, focus you know on customers and products and margins? Is that you know does that does that explain my question? Yes, uh, very well. The music in pricing plays in price differentiation, and I can use a very simple image or picture to describe that. Okay. If you have the price and the sales, and then you have the demand curve, these three variables describe a triangle. If you have only one so-called uniform price, you cut only a rectangle out of the triangle, which means you leave 50% of the profit potential on the table. And the challenge is to get away from the rectangle to the triangle. And one of the important dimensions which you mentioned is that you differentiate your prices according to customers. And Adam has a nice uh, example, which uh, he brought into the book. Maybe Adam can describe that, how we adjust price increases depending on the margins of the past. Please do. Adam, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, Gene, I think your your core point is spot on. We talk about how a difference between this inflation and the one in the 70s is digital and all the data and information that are at our fingertips to do a little bit more today than we could have back then. Um, but some of the examples we get into are, how do you differentiate? How do you get a lot more granularity in your, um, in your, in your pricing? Um, you probably gonna have to edit this part. Herman, which example are you talking about in the book? We had this example where we looked at the margins of the customers yeah. in the past. Yeah, okay, the bigger ones having yeah. more manifestation. Uh, All perhaps right. you can explain what that means for the current uh, pricing under the inflation. Yep. All right. Gina. And Adam, do not Adam, do not worry. We can we can we are going to edit and do some post production. So um, let me let me start off with. I'll pitch it back out to you. Okay. Sure, and I'll pick yep. it back up. Yep. So yep, Adam, I'd like to hear I'd like to hear more about that. But the floor is yours. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, one difference we talk about that is happening in this inflation versus the 70s is digital, that we have so much more information available and that lets us do better things. And so to Herman's point about going from a rectangle to a triangle and extracting by being much more targeted in your pricing is 100% is accurate. A couple of things that we pointed out uh, that are maybe counterintuitive, but pretty important for people to realize is um, I would say 2021, uh, we were doing surveys of executives at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022, asking how many had done an inflationary price adjustment. And at that point, as March of 2022, uh, still about a third had not taken any sort of price action in response to inflation. And so we certainly saw 
as late as early 2022, people were still doing the blunt force objects. Now we're all getting into much more granular pricing. And when you look at that, some of the phenomenon that we, we see again and again is that managers are all would be well suited to realize they're going to get higher yields from some of their higher margin accounts already. Right. But historically, people would just look at their accounts and say, we have to do a, a 10% across the board price increase. <clears throat> and then if they tried to get more granular, what they'd often do is look at their thinner margin accounts and go, hey, let's hit them harder because they're lower margin. We got to bring them back up. Uh, what's overlooked in that logic is they're thinner for a reason. They probably see less value. They right. are probably quicker to switch or find a substitution or just not consume the do nothing alternative. And over experience, experience again, and at Simon Kutcher will often find that you manifest better results with some of your healthier margin accounts because they often see more value today. That's why they're paying more already. And so when you get into the granularity and how you might treat different customers differently beyond just some of the demographic factors, that's some of the elements of um, current account relationships that you can consider as we work through this inflation. Makes sense. Makes sense. Herman, what is, um, why do you feel that step pricing or stepwise pricing are more advantageous? Um, first of all, could you explain what you mean by stepwise versus a one-time price adjustment? And um, I'm, I'm curious, you go into detail in the book. I'm curious if you can explain a little bit more here why you, why, why you prefer stepwise. When you look at the last decade of price stability, you typically increased your price once a year by a modest amount. On the average for the economy, uh, about 2%. Now you have cost changes uh, every day, every week. And the question is, should you wait a couple of months to adjust your prices or should you do it more frequently? And our advice is very clearly do it more frequently. And we observe that with good companies, uh, I know quite a few companies who have increased their prices six or eight times in the course of 2022. And it has another advantage. If you increase your price under these circumstances only say once or twice per year, you have to make a big jump. Mm. And usually customers react very negatively to big price increases. So by doing it more frequently, you avoid these big jumps. Hmm. So it's both from a behavioral and from a time perspective, advantages to increase prices more frequently in smaller steps instead of infrequently in one big step. Adam, you know, you know, Herman talks about doing this, you know, you know, frequently and with smaller increases, um, you know, you know, over the course of a period of time. Um, I mentioned earlier about how, you know, our parents and grandparents didn't have the data that a lot of businesses have today, you know, back in the 70s. The other thing they did not have back then was um, uh, technology, like communications, you know, and mm -hmm. I wonder, Adam, if you can speak to um, the importance, because this is this is part of the book as well about um, you. Know, if you're going to be doing consistent increases or or frequent increases, step, you know, stepwise to your customers, it, it's very very important to be communicating with them. Correct. I mean, we have Outlook and Gmail now and CRM systems, and I'm curious if you can you can talk a little bit about why that's important. Yeah, I think absolutely. From a perspective of if, if pricing is the manifestation of value and the conversation is around price to value in that equation, you know, we are coming off of a decade where you know, value was sort of taken for granted. You tried to get a 2% inflationary adjustment and, and no one really worried about, I would say on average, a lot of people weren't worried about value communication. Um, you know, one of the reasons that you can realize your pricing power or affect your pricing power over time is to communicate the value of your products. And we might have lost sight a little bit of that in the last decade. Um, yeah. A lot of our, you know, Herman mentioned, we work a lot with mid-market companies, a lot of industrial companies and folks where there's no billboard advertising the product. It's on the onus of the sellers every single day to get out there and remind people of the value that their product brings. And if you think about where we are right now, if we're going through inflation and, and having to push prices at higher levels more frequent, 
the onus of reminding folks what they're getting, why it's valuable, what's going on, and then using digital tools. You mentioned a couple of things that you know, we all have the spam in our inbox. We have constant reminders and drip feeds, but it does work and it does remind people over time. And there's a lot more things that people can do to build out more accurate forms of communication, um, go from just a, a large scale approach to much more client specific. Here's what we did yesterday, last week, last month for you to add value and maintain value and why in exchange for that, it's fair that our prices be adjusted. So that's a huge portion. It is an entire chapter of the idea of value communication and how to re get back to leaning into that as something that's uh, critical during an inflationary period. And what you write about is also stuff that I, I I'm seeing in the real world with, with my best clients. You know, there was back in the day you would, um, you know, Adam, you would, you, you would blast out an email to your whole database and, you know, my better clients, I mean, they've segmented their database pretty in a granular way. You know, they have lists of customers based on the products they buy, the industries they're in, the regions they're in. Um, mm -hmm. So they can really target communications and messaging to the people that are really going to be interested in what the message is. And they're, you know, I think they're letting their customers know, because I think nowadays, listen, we all know that we're in an inflationary period, right, Adam? So, you know, our customers, they're doing it to their customers. They, they're, they're looking to raise price. They're, they're not going to be surprised when they hear that their price are going up, but they just want to know, like, when. And they want to always make sure that they're, that they're, they're, like you said, they're still getting value back, you know, from that, from that product that they're buying. Um, it's so critical to make sure that you're staying in touch with your people, correct? Yeah, I mean, signaling is always uh, important um, just to make sure people know it's coming, right? If you go yep. back to sales 101, people hate surprises in that environment. And so to go for months and hoping that nothing would happen and then release a 35% price increase really catches people off guard. Uh, to Herman's point, not only is it better to do it on a more frequent rolling basis, but that also often puts you in a position to communicate it more frequently, um, both the obligation of communicating the value of your product, and then also that changes are coming. And a lot of folks, I think in the last 18 months have tried to get off that once a year price increase cycle and get to something that's a little bit more um, rapid. Yeah, You're seeing a lot of other things. You know, we mentioned earlier about digitalization, two big points there. One is products these days are getting an IT overlay. They can understand what you're doing. So not only can your customers segment people based on where they are and, and kind of what they, uh, might behave like, but now they can watch how the products are being used. They can quantify the value that's getting extracted and delivered in their products, and they can use that to inform a pricing conversation. And that's mm. pretty powerful stuff. Let me add something, Gene. Please. Um, many of our clients are B2B suppliers, and okay. their customers have new problems under the inflationary conditions, especially to increase their productivity, to, re to reduce uh, raw materials, etc. And the foundation for, for the right response to this situation is to understand these needs and the changes in these needs. And of course, with the internet and uh, IT, we can help them so, for instance, reduce their, uh, their, their, their cycle, their ordering periods, their uh, dynamics. And this is a, a big difference to the 1970s. Uh, we are today very, very closely connected to our, our customers and we can help them to improve their productivity, to reduce the time they need to increase their agility. And that creates willingness to pay. If we really offer us value in this sense, they are willing to give us 5% or 7% more, which helps us and helps them to survive this crisis. And Gene, That's great. Go ahead, Em. Like a great example of how we'll often say that you know, inflation is not just a cost phenomenon, it, it's a price and a value phenomenon. And the example mm -hmm. that I give that helps land well with folks is robotics. So I, I am a mechanical background. I sit in Silicon Valley. I get to work with a lot of uh, really impressive automation robotics companies. So many people are thinking about, oh, my costs are going up. My, my steel is becoming more expensive, my energy. So I need to think about reflecting that. Well, if you think about a robot, a lot of applications, it's trying to automate work and remove labor costs. Well, inflation 
and where we are right now with the wage um, inflation spiral kicking in, the cost of that labor is going up, up, up. So the mm -hmm. value of the robot is going up, up, up. Yes. Yeah. People are just thinking, oh, my costs are going up. I have to pass that through. They're missing the point, which is in a lot of the products out there, the value you're delivering through your product is also changing dramatically because of inflation. And so capturing that portion in the conversation is really the important part versus great just point. looking at how your costs are changing. It's a great point. It's a great point. Okay, so I don't know which one of you guys want to take this question, but um, you you both write in the book that um, you're 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 not a fan of of just passing on 100% of your cost increases to your customers, um, which is a knee jerk reaction that that a lot of my clients have. Frankly, I have. You know, if I have a uh, you know an outside contractor that I'm using to work on a client project and the person increases their fee, I like I just turn right around and do the same increase right to my customer, and. Uh, you know, you say that's wrong. And I'm wondering which one of you guys would like to answer this. Maybe Herman, I'll, I'll pick on you. Um, why is that not, you know, why is it not optimal to fully pass on, you know, a cost increase to your customer? It's the same reason that cost plus pricing is not optimal. In pricing, you have to observe three sides. The cost, obviously, the demand side, the customer, his, her willingness to pay and the competition. Mm -hmm. And if you are just passing on the costs, you neglect both the customer and the competition. And our experience is that you can recover about 50% of the cost increases by passing them through to the price. 25% you have to recover through productivity increases. So cost reductions, and maybe under the prevailing circumstances, you have to swallow 25%. That is realistic. For most businesses, unless they have really very, very strong pricing power, it's unrealistic to recover the cost increases fully by passing them through. Got it. One okay. has to be realistic in that regard and not uh, be a dreamer. And Gene, I, I would pick up on that and say, I think, 2023 people are really going to realize that uh, i would argue that some were so far behind the curve maybe mm. in 2022 that after they absorbed multiple price increases to themselves then their third or fourth one they tried to pass on through at 100 percent, they felt like it worked um, because you had a lot of laggards who were then finally taking action in late 21 throughout 2022 mm -hmm. but as we go through in, you know, in the text, we kind of lay out examples. We use real uh, response curve and elasticities, things that we would typically expect to see and try to prove out that 100% pass-through of your costs is suboptimal um, and usually comes at an expensive cost to the business. You know, uh, Adam, uh, Herman just mentioned about, you know, pricing power, uh, you know, figuring into that, that decision. And you guys write all about that. You'd like to devote a whole chapter to it. Um, I wrote down, you know, you used, you know, Warren Buffett's quote, the single most important criteria for him in evaluating a business is pricing power. Um, when I think of pricing power, I think of like, uh, you know, like a, a utility. I mean, somebody that just, they can, they can increase prices. They have a lot of flexibility in how they can increase prices. So Adam is, is that, a, is that correct? I mean, what, what do you, what, how do you define pricing power? Um, what types of companies have the most pricing power? This is for you, Adam. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'll turn to you, Herman, to, to, I'd like to get some advice on how a business or a company can increase their own pricing power. But Adam, I'll, st I'll start with you. T tell us what pricing power is and what industries or companies you see out there that, to give us an example of who has a lot of pricing power. Yeah. So pricing power is the ability to manifest the prices you would desire for your goods and services in the marketplace. And what we'll find is about a third, about 30% of respondents to our surveys over time would suggest that they have pricing power. Um, that would include things like utilities where it's kind of a scale and a monopolistic environment that created pricing power. And then it's also companies that have done a really good job building it over time. And uh, we point out that pricing power is not something you create quickly. Um, hmm. This last few years has been really about where are we? How much pricing power might I have? Because for those 30% that believe they have some, 70% are more likely to be confused rather than not have any. And, and we would argue that maybe 
30% really don't have any, they're true followers, but 40% have a lot more than they think. They just mm -hmm. haven't really done the work to figure it out and try to exercise that pricing power. So you'll find that through innovation, great technology, kind of someone who's put something out there first. Uh, you'll find sometimes it's been manifest through supply chain and operational efficiencies like an Amazon, uh, kind of creating their pricing power through that. Um, so there's a host of ways that you can get it. And if we think about kind of, again, where we are right now going into 2023, I do think we're at a tipping point where if the last few years have just been reacting and trying to get a handle on where we are, um, this year and going forward will be really about understanding our pricing power much more granularly and trying to build it over time for a lot of these organizations who are in that middle 40% and might be confused. Herman, don't you think that, you know, most companies, actually, I'm going to say just about all companies have some, you know, some level of pricing power. It, there's a sweet spot. I mean, I'll give you an example of, you know, I mean, Netflix can increase their monthly fees by a dollar a month and, you know, they're going to retain you know, their customers, people aren't going to cancel network inflicts, you know, because of that, of course, if they raise it by a hundred dollars a month, they would lose a lot of customers, you know? And I think even my own business, you know, we charge an hourly rate for our services. We're 175 bucks an hour. I, yeah. If, if we started charging $177 an hour, um, we're not going to lose clients because of that. But if we started charging, you know, $300 an hour, some clients would drop off. In other words, I, it just seems to me that most businesses have pricing power, but they don't realize they're not, they're not maximizing that or really thinking about it. Does that make sense, Herman? And, and what advice would you have for, com for companies that yeah. want to maximize uh, their pricing power? I, I am a little skeptical about this view. Okay. It's true that pricing power is a, 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 a matter of decree to, to a certain degree, but it's also a matter of category and and uh, mm. an example which everybody would understand to explain pricing power is apple let's assume that apple increases the price of the iphone of the most recent iphone by 10 percent okay so that would be 100 or 150 dollars how much would they lose i would say they lose three percent of their customer Okay. Now let's assume that Samsung or Huawei do the same. They increase their price by 10%. They might lose 20 or 30% of their customers. Mm. Not all, they still retain 80 or 70%. But there you see that it's also not only a matter of, of decree, it's a matter uh, addressed in Warren Buffett's statement of, of categorical differences. Behind that is actually a model which we call the Gutenberg model. And the Gutenberg model says for small price increases, you typically lose very few customers. So the, the situation you describe, we increase our price by 1%, you are not losing anybody or very few. But then there is a threshold and this threshold is different for companies. It may be 3% for one company, it may be right. 5 or it may be 20 for a company like Apple. So the best way to explain in, in clear uh, analytical terms is this Gutenberg price response curve, which is flat close to the current price and then has a threshold. Mm. And the question is, where is this threshold? I was just going to ask you that question. How do we, how do we figure out what that threshold is? That's our know-how. To measure where this threshold is mm. and uh, that's different for a porsche sports car um, than for a general motors car and finding that threshold not to to go over the threshold and fall off the cliff is the challenge especially under the current circumstances where the threshold moves everything costs move cost change and uh, willingness to pay changes and so that is a very critical and, and, and sensitive issue. This clarifies a lot of what you guys do. I mean, Herman, I mean, th that is the kind of service and value that you would provide to your clients, right? I mean, you would, you would come into a client and say to them, we're going to do our analysis and our research and, you know, our proprietary methodology, and we're going to come back to you and we're going to help you figure out where that threshold is for your products. 
because you're you're probably you know maybe you're underpricing your products and you could be getting more value without losing yeah. a significant amount of customers am i describing what you do correctly yes you describe that well but we go one step further mm. we do not only uh, tell our clients where is this threshold we we use a method called conjoint measurement to quantify this threshold but we also tell our clients how can you move this threshold hmm. by faster delivery, by higher guarantees, by uh, services you are adding to your products? Right. How much does that cost? If it costs 5% more, but it moves the threshold 10%, we would do it. If it costs 5% more, but moves the threshold only 2%, we would not recommend to do it. Makes sense. So both the analysis, where is the threshold? plus how can we move it how can we change it there's so much in this book i am never going to get to all of my questions but adam i'm going to turn to you I, i'm i'm kind of picking and choosing certain things that really intrigue me that i know i get asked about so adam yeah. um price escalator clauses you guys you know you mentioned in your book um you know it it's it, that seems like the perfect world you know like you know every you know every Every time you're selling products to a customer, you have a you know an order agreement, and there's a price escalator built in. You know if inflation goes over to a certain amount, the price gets bumped up, or every year the price gets bumped up. I mean, some industries do that, like real estate, for example. You know, property management. It's like that's just part of the industry. But a lot of my clients would have a really tough time, you know, doing that. Um, so, you know, Adam, what what are your thoughts on price escalators? Do do companies not make enough? use of them do you do you feel that that's sort of like an under an underused tactic that companies can use to protect themselves against inflation yeah escalators are interesting and they're a good example of how a tactic that was out of favor just a few years ago might make more sense today um so if we went back in time to the mid you know 2010s not a lot of people were doing escalators because people were pointing at inflation. That's usually something that people use to drive or indicate what the escalator level should be. So at one and a half or 2%, you would rather say, I don't want any escalator. I can add value to my product above and beyond 2%. And I'm better off having a negotiation every year and mm. trying to get five, six, 7%. Um, you had software companies. Uh, you, you would see around 2010 escalators were just getting introduced at 3%-ish. Then they kind of stepped up to that six to 7% range coming to the end of the 2010s, right? Going into COVID, you were starting to see double digit annual escalators. And the theory there being the software was improving in value at such a tremendous rate in SaaS software that it made sense to pay these escalators. Um, a lot of industrial companies and others weren't doing them. You kind right. of flash forward to today, that theory still holds true. So if you're able to add more value, if, if inflation is 8%, but you're investing in R&D, if you're investing in your customer service and you're adding 15% value every year, you should still not use an escalator and try to put yourself in a position to recover that 15%. Mm. But I think you will find as inflation accelerates, it's uh, it's it might make more sense to go with a contractual escalator where your ability to negotiate those levels at a repeat basis would be really hard to manifest. So if you could get an eight or 9% annual escalator contractually um, documented for the, maybe the next three years, that could be the win. But again, Got it's it. going to be really specific to your company, how well suited you are to create new value and then capture it through your sales force uh, versus just does the concept make sense at a sure. macro level as well as explaining it to customers, both new and existing, you know, about this. Cause like you said, this is, it's, it's not something that's as commonly used nowadays, although it was, you know, back in the day. Yeah. So it might, that gets back to the whole communications, you know, with your customers, why this might make sense for them, you know, um, you know, as well as yourself. Um, Herman, turn it to you. You, you also mentioned this is in the same chapter of like, you know, smart pricing strategies about reducing package size, which, is the you know the 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 media term for that is shrinkflation you know and you know you buy a bag of Doritos uh, a bag of Doritos used to be nine point seven did you guys know this it used to be nine point seven five ounces and now it's nine point two five ounces uh, but it's the same price you know <laughs> it's the same thing with uh, 
you know, toilet paper and, and paper towels. And you even go into like hotels where you know, you're no longer seeing all the little amenities that you're used to, including like maid service in your room. You have to request it now. Um, but it's, you know, but they maintain the same price, you know, for the rooms. So that's like, Herman, that's like selling a little less of something, but for the same price, because you're protecting your margin that way. I'm, shrinkflation is what, what people call it. Yeah. Give me your thoughts on it. Do you, do you think that's a good practice? Do you, you know, no. you don't. I that's think it. it's a bad practice. I am against it. Okay. Due to two reasons. First, you can only do it once. You cannot shrink the package size to zero. <laughs> True. And uh, secondly, uh, customers feel deceived. If they, they notice that they paid the same price, but now the package is 10% uh, less, uh, it's, it's not uh, a way to create good feelings and preferences for your products. I, I must say that I'm surprised how many companies use this tactic. They do. They do. <laughs> against, against my opinion, against our advice. Gene, one thing I think that we speak to and, and we'll see more of going forward is less than just shrinkflation is what we call a less expensive alternative or an LEA. Yeah. And so rather I'm than sorry? A, what? a less expensive alternative, oh, less expensive alternative. Okay. I see. Or an LEA. Okay. So if right. you have a product, let's say you have a premium product and inflation is putting you in a position where someone's either going to price out of your ecosystem and go to a competitor, um, or you feel your only alternative is to lower your price. Well, software figured this out a long time ago, and now we're seeing that um, material good manufacturers are figuring it out. You can make something a little bit less expensive. Now, maybe you strip out some of the services and warranties, maybe you de-feature, but you you communicate it and you're clear about it, that this is not the same Dorito bag, um, but hey, we have a, a, a smaller package size for you. And I as see. you do that, you give consumers options to keep them in your ecosystem but you don't erode the trust, as Herman mentioned, by just uh, making people feel like they were tricked into something that's less valuable. That's a great point. And Herman's point is also very true. I, you know, I, I do feel like it's misleading and deceptive, and yet so many major brands do it and uh, seem to get away with it. Um, but it, it's it, it's not something that I'm crazy about either. But having said that, I mean, listen, it's people are doing what they're doing to try and maintain margins. So uh, it's not against the law. It's just uh, It just seems a little unethical. Um, guys, we're we're almost out of time. You've been so patient and so good in discussing this. And for for all of you that are watching or or listening to this conversation, you know we're scratching the surface of of the different tactics and strategies that both Adam and and Herman are providing for uh, pricing your products and your services in inflationary times. I just one final topic I did I did want to ask you know and and Adam I'll pick on you first. Um, you you have one whole chapter that's devoted towards uh, you know innovative pricing systems. You know when you talk about dynamic pricing and multi-dimensional pricing systems. And I'm curious if, can you, among others, so for you watching or listening, you can listen to, you can, you can explore some of the other innovative pricing strategies that uh, Herman and, and, and Adam, um, you know, recommend, but just to give you a little taste of it, you know, for you, the listener or the watcher, Adam, tell us a little bit about what dynamic pricing is and, and what multi-dimensional pricing is and, who, what, and where? Why would I want to consider either one of those tactics? Yeah. So most people are familiar with dynamic pricing from airplanes and hotel rooms, right? It looks at sort of a fixed amount of capacity and then adjusts the price in real time. And if I log on next week, my flight to New York might be different than my flight today. So there are industries where I think everyone broadly accepts dynamic pricing and understands how it works. What we're seeing as a result of the scarcity and some of the supply shocks that were happening, let's say you're an industrial company, right? And suddenly you have demand for 13,000 units, but you can only make 10. So what we're starting to see, um, you, you wouldn't just go dynamic on all of your units and just make it a free for all in a bidding war. That right. would have kind of some negative backlash to you and, and your long-term relationships, which is one reason we haven't seen this in industrial businesses mm -hmm. historically is that long buying memory. Mm -hmm. But what we are seeing now is, you know, you take your key accounts, set them aside. You take a lot of mid accounts, set them aside. And what's left is a long tail of smaller accounts who are demanding five or 6,000 units and you can only serve them with two. And maybe there you're starting to 
realize that the only fair treatment would be something that's a dynamic bid system to clear that last set of units. I see. Otherwise, how would you decide? Oh, well, you were the first one to ask or this salesperson knows you better. And so you get an allocation problem that manifests itself in the last few years of, of inflation. And we're seeing those systems getting built out in new places. Um, we often joke that when the tourist industry stopped during COVID, all those people who do dynamic pricing for airlines and hotels, they didn't go away. They just went and applied their skills to other businesses. <laughs> so we're betting that inflation is going to cause a, a, a blossoming of dynamic systems and some of these innovative pricing models into new markets and segments as we get through it. And this sort of sets into a more of a permanent um, high inflation environment. Got it. Um, Multidimensional, please. you mentioned. Yes. Um, a famous case is Amazon with Amazon Prime. So Amazon has actually two prices, one for the product and one for Amazon Prime. Why, why do you buy for $139 Amazon Prime? Because you are getting better services. You are willing to pay $139, which is not a net negligible amount. Or this is an interesting case. That is the so-called barn card or rail card of the German Railroad Corporation, it costs even $500. Why do I buy this card? Because it gives me a discount of 50% on all tickets for the duration of one year. So the Railway Corporation has two prices now. One for the bank card, it sells 6 million of these cards at a price of $500 plus the price of the ticket. And I'm less infected, uh, affected by inflation because I pay only 50% for the ticket. So right. if the ticket goes up $50, I pay only 25% more. So it has become very popular under inflationary conditions. From one dimensional only ticket price to a two dimensional pricing system, ticket price plus card price. Berman, who should read this book? Every manager, every entrepreneur, who thinks that he can do better in inflation. And inflation affects everybody. I, I would even recommend it to consumers because they better understand what's going on and can make better purchasing decisions for themselves. So and, that's a way to beating inflation. And you know, the, the title of this book is called Beating Inflation, an Agile Concrete and Effective Corporate Guide. Um, I, you know, I, I get the, you, it, I just get the takeaway here that inflation, we have not been dealing with it for a long period of time. Um, but it's going to take a while for inflation, if it ever does, to get back to the levels that we saw it, you know, a few years ago. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And, and yeah. is that even in, is that even a consideration when you're doing your pricing? Absolutely. First, the current generation of managers and entrepreneurs doesn't have experience with inflation. I still do. I, I did my doctoral thesis during the inflation of the 1970s. You're dating yourself. And, yeah. And <laughs> uh, so they, they have to learn. It's a new phenomenon for them. Yes. How long is it going to stay? In my opinion, five to 10 years. And the reason is in the second category, the expansion of the money supply. It's not so easy to reduce the money supply. The money supply is about three times higher than it was 10 years ago. And uh, the cross domestic product has only increased, increased by about 30%. So as in the 70s, I think we have to expect an inflation, say, of around 5% per year for the next five to 10 years. The book is called Beating Inflation, an Agile, Concrete, and Effective Corporate Guide. I've been speaking to Herman Simon and Adam Ector. Uh, Herman and Adam, thank you guys both so much. Very informative. I strongly recommend for any manager, business owner, entrepreneur looking to better price their products and services. This is a, a great book to read, and we are only scratching the surface. So thank you very much for spending the time. Our pleasure. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Gene. Everybody, you've been uh, watching and listening to Biz Books. My name is Gene March. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, we'll be back in another couple of weeks with another interview with a great business author or authors of a great business book. Again, thanks. We will see you again soon. Take care.